Hello and welcome back. In this episode, we will take a look at particle neighbor searches. Especially, we will compare the no grid method uh, versus the hash grid method. And we will see how much performance we can get out of a hash grid. The easiest and probably the most straightforward way to implement does not use any data structure to optimize. So let's see what that means for our performance. At the really top, there's our particle count. Right below is the performance, how long it will take to compare every particle against every particle. And at the really bottom, there's our comparison count. So how much comparisons are there actually? All right, then let's start our small comparison. As you already can see, that with 1000 we already reached to 1 million, now it's already 3 million, 4 million, 5 million, and so on. And you can see the performance is getting really, really slow now. And as you will see, when we reach the 4000 particle count, we have um, yeah, 16 million comparisons and that's just too much you can also see already 60 milliseconds um yeah and now we're reaching the 5000 mark and we have like 90 milliseconds per neighbor search and this is just unacceptable also we have 25 million comparisons. Another example with an actual grid. On the right side you see a particle floating around. Um, this just uh, indicates that it's actually working and getting the neighbor of this one particle. And on the right side um, you see that the cells are also bigger. The left one is the unoptimized one and the right one has a smaller uh, cell size for its particles. And you can see the right one is a lot faster than the left one because the right one has sm has a smaller amount of particles in its in its uh, neighbor cells, so there aren't that much comparisons. And now to the more special one, this one. Uh, uses a sorting uh, of the particles um, with their hash ID and this means that the particles in the same cell or in nearby cells will have a close or consecutive hash ID and that means um, more cache hits which means a, a higher performance and you can see we have 5000 particles with just around 7 milliseconds all right, sounds cool, but how can we do that? Well, our first step is to convert a position to a grid index. And we can do that by dividing the position components, X and Y, by the cell size. In this case, uh, a cell has a size of 100. And if we divide the position, the X and the Y component, uh, by 100, we get the grid index. Note that we have to uh, floor that value down to the next integer value. Or we can simply parse it. That would work too. There might be a small problem, however. The particle can also go into a negative position. That means that the grid index will be negative too, which will probably lead to some problems when we are calculating our hash value. But let's see how we can convert a grid index to a hash value first. For our conversion, we can use two methods or two calculations. One is for the 2D case and the other one is for the 3D case. If you want to do a 3D simulation, then use the hash 3D calculation. For the 2D case, we need prime numbers and a hash map size. The higher the prime number and the hash map size, the less collisions will be. That means that particles won't be mapped to the wrong bucket or to the wrong cell. 
That might happen if your RAM numbers are too small or your hash map is too small. So let's see what our conversion will give us. On the left, you see our current grid index. We calculated in the last step. On the right, you see the current hash value, which is currently calculated from the grid index. In the middle, you see our calculation for the 2D hash value. And as you can see now, when the particle goes into a minus position, the hash value will also be minus, except if both x and y components are minus, then the hash value will be positive again. A negative hash value will probably lead into problems when we want to map a particle. We can avoid the problem if we take the absolute value from the hash value or from the hash function, or we can offset our grid index by a large number. Now that we have this hash value, we can use it to put all the particles in that cell into a map or in a dictionary. That depends on your language. I think in C-sharp it was a dictionary or in Java, I'm not sure. But anyways, um, yeah, by using the hash as a key, we can now put all the particles from that cell into the map. Okay, and now to the last step, retrieving our neighbors. First, I need the particle from which I want the neighbors from. Then I'm creating a empty array and I'm call it the neighbors array. After that, I convert the position of my particle I want the neighbors from to the particle grid index with the techniques I showed you before. Then I'm iterating through the neighbor cells of my current cell from the particle to get the neighbors because the particle can have a radius or a interaction radius, which will overlap with other um, cells. So I need to get the neighbor cells too. Well, and then I'm gonna uh, calculate the grid index for every cell, um, convert the grid index again to a hash, and then I get the content of every neighbor cell through that hash map. And at the end, I'm gonna add all the content of a cell, all the content of a neighbor cell to my neighbors. And then I'm at the end and I can return my neighbor list. And this is how we can implement a particle neighbor search for our fluid simulation. In the upcoming tutorial, I'm also gonna explain how we can add a sorting to our particles for our fluid simulation. All right, the next episode, I'm gonna show you how we can implement exactly what I was talking about today, how we can implement a uh, neighbor search in practice. All right, then that's it for this video. I hope it was um, quite understandable and I hope to see you in the next video. Have a nice day and bye-bye.